Hi, and welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary here on Martha's Vineyard. If you have not seen this show before, my name is Art Bergeron. My day job is as an elder law attorney at Myrick O'Connell. But this is not about my day job. It's my, about my friends Frank and Mary. If you haven't seen the show before, you know that my, my, goal, my friends Frank and Mary, if you've seen any of my seminars, they have a very simple goal. They want to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And if that's on Martha's Vineyard, that means right here. They don't want to go to the mainland. They definitely don't want to go to Nantucket. They want to be right here. And so the question is, who are the people they need to know? What are the programs they need to know about in order to live happily ever after right here on Martha's Vineyard? So many, a few people know me, but everybody seems to know Sandy Cordoby, my wonderful co-host who has been doing these shows with me, how long? Like, like two years, two, three years, a long time. Maybe. Yeah, and, 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 and so she's the person that finds all these great guests. We've had this guest on before, but you know, this stuff, her stuff is really relevant to like right now, which is in the middle of this disaster, especially for seniors of COVID-19. So, um, 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 but I'll introduce Sandy to introduce the guest. So Sandy, who do we have today? Hi, Arthur. Thank you. Um, so I'm Sandy Cordoby and I own Horizons Geriatric Care Management, which is the island's geriatric case management company. And, and the person that I go to for all things geriatric on Martha's Vineyard is Megan Rose Panic, who is the director of our local ASAP office, the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, um, Cape and Islands Division of Elder Services. And Megan has all the answers as to what to do with elders that need help in the community. Right, it, right Megan? That's doesn't right. It kill, doesn't it kill you when you get introduced like that? It's like, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> the person with all the answers. All the answers. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sandy and Arthur, for having me today. Our pleasure, our pleasure. So sort of simply put, Megan, we're, we're sort of like, what are we like 10 months into this pandemic now? And I, I don't know about you, but I've seen some pretty big iterations of effects on our elder population with the pandemic. If you had to pick the top two that you think are the biggest effects of our elder community and what our challenges as caregivers are for the elder community, what would they be, do you think? So definitely isolation um, is a big one for, for what we've seen um, because obviously most of the social programs that operate on the island are no longer happening. So, um, you know, for people to get out and do that social activity, it's so important. And um, unfortunately, COVID has really restricted that recently. So we have seen um, a little bit of that more isolation um, with COVID. And of course, that's happening with everyone. But for the elder population as well, um, the isolation is definitely there. Um, also, there was a big push for food access and you know different um, ways to get that, especially during COVID. So uh, we had been a part of a big food equity um, network group that kind of worked with all the different ways that elders could access food during the pandemic. So that was another big need in the beginning of the of COVID, but um, really uh, is a good example of organizations coming and working together to um, really provide that service to the island. And I really think that everyone's in that area has done such a great job. Mm -hmm. um, obviously we deal with workforce availability issues and uh, there that is no stranger to COVID. And I would even say this has gotten worse, unfortunately, with the shortages of staffing and, and things like that. So those are probably the two major things that I've, I've seen so far. I think the, the shortages in staffing is, you know, not only we've got kids home from school and a lot of our human resources through the agencies have our, our school age kids' moms. So kids are home from school and they're trying to homeschool and that's requiring a lot of support on the part of the parents. We've had a, a few times where we've had um, some of our caregiver population has had to quarantine because they or the child got exposed. Um, so whether they got it or not, they still were out of work for a couple of weeks. Um, and I think the other piece, at least from what I can see at Horizons, is we have so many more folks that are utilizing their previously summer only homes, but now staying here um, because it, it felt like a bit more safe. 
Um, and they need services that they would be getting in their own communities of Florida, Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, wherever it was, right? So all of that is really tapping the human resources. Is that pretty much what you're seeing? Absolutely. I think it's a combination of those things. Exactly what you said. People, more people are staying here. And then you have not only people getting COVID and having to quarantine, but also, you know, schools and, and stuff being closed that that puts a huge burden on, um, you know, that part of the workforce that we had before. Um, so absolutely, that that's correct. And, and definitely something that we've seen. And so would you, uh, for those people who, when you say the people who are staying, is this folks who would normally like be going to Florida in the winter or, or, or the, are these folks who from around the country who would only typically, even they were from Pennsylvania, but they typically be here in the summer, but now they're actually using their house year round. And so you're just actually seeing this bump in, you know, just a bump in the population. Yeah. It's like, is like both of, it's like really both of those things. And do you know, has that affected the school population? Is, is the school population gone up? During the school during this school year, I was just wondering. I just didn't. I just didn't. I don't know. think so because we're we're still out of school. I mean, some of our kids went back to in class today, but we're we're still a lot of us are still out of school. So, and kids that are here, and there are some kids yeah. that are here. They're homeschooling to their schools back in Connecticut. Oh, I so see. they're not they're not in our schools, but since they. Are in a hybrid program of doing a lot of online learning they're doing it with their schools at home but yes there's a huge population of elders that would have sort of been summer birds for us that have stayed yep so megan if, if in terms of the the programs that 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 elder services of cape cod and the islands does which is like this huge variety of programs are you are you finding that you're that you're going to be bumping up bump, bumping into any of this vaccine or the vaccine rollout or any, any of that stuff, or are you involved with the groups that are trying to figure that out right now? Because I know that's it's it's just it, it's it's so bizarre because you feel like it's just around the corner, you know, in many ways. Exactly. And and so people are finally getting aware of the fact that ramping up for this is like, oh my God, how's that going to happen, right? Yes, we are in the group that's part of the figuring out when when it's going to happen. And I, I believe we we are thinking that some of our programs could be included in the first phase coming in February, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. um, but we haven't really confirmed the specifics yet to who will be included in that category. I'm assuming it would be people who are going into the homes who actually have the the one-on-one -on -one contact with elders and, and people who are higher risk for COVID. Um, so that's my assumption and I think is part of the planning process for the vaccine. And, and um, I think we'll start to see a little bit more news on that um, in the next few weeks or so. But um, so that's so far the news I have on that. And that is a big, you know, that's a big question. So many of our elders are really concerned about when's my turn? When am I going to get it? It's, it's right. difficult because different states are rolling it out differently. You know, mm -hmm. I have got people that are saying to me as recently as this morning, well, maybe I just need to go down to Florida for a month because I can already get it if I go to Florida. Um, so it is, it, it's very difficult. The anxiety level is really high and, um, and, I feel bad for people because I just don't think we have the answers just yet. We're doing, we're rolling this all out in real time. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm confident that all of those at-risk populations needs are going to get met. But the first time that there was a photo in the, in the papers, the local papers with a box of vaccine arriving on the island, basically people just started storming the castle over at the hospital to say, <laughs> when's my turn? You know, I know right. it's here. Where is it? You know, and, I don't blame them. There's a lot well, of fear around this, but um, it, it it's just kind of rolling out as it rolls out. And I think as AstraZeneca and, and some of the other labs get approved and we have more access to vaccine, yep. it'll happen a little bit faster. But I got a call from an elder this morning who said, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I just called the doctor's office, which means the call center at the hospital. Mm -hmm. and, and the person there told me that I wasn't going to get my shot till the end of May. I'm like, I, I just don't think anybody knows. And I'm sorry no. if somebody just took a guess at that, but I, and he's 85 and he's got multiple, you know, medical concerns. 
And I was like, Comor comorbidity. Yeah, comorbidity. Yeah. yeah. Just hold on. I think, you know, more information is going to come loose in the coming weeks and it'll get more clear. Right. And, and that's another one of the issues is I was, I was just doing one of these shows in uh, Northborough, which is one of the neighboring towns to where I live. Right. And they were talking and the, and the woman who was the public health agent there said, you know, one of the issues <clears throat> or she's thinking that it may be that phase two is going to end up being bigger than phase three, because phase two includes everybody over 70. Well, the first everybody over 75 and then everybody over 65 or if you've got two comorbidities. And she said, like, everybody's got two comorbidities. She said, she said the, the list of comorbidities. I said, what the heck's a comorbidity? She said, it's like everything. It's like cancer. It's diabetes. It's like a million. It's like um, everything Americans have, right? Diabetes and a hangnail. And a ton, a, yeah, and a ton of Americans, right. A ton of Americans have all this stuff. She said, and, you know, and, and then I said, you know, it is funny. When I heard this, this one story, you know, there's going to be this strange, this, this strange thing. It's going to be like, you're repeating your teenage years where you're getting these fake IDs to show that you're older than you really are. You know, it's like, oh yeah, I'm 75. Just look at, you know, just look at, just look at the picture to try to get to qualify. So is there, is there, so I, I know in Nantucket, I, I shouldn't say that, on the other island, on the other mm -hmm. island, um, what they, they've actually done, this, gotten this like, sent, they're doing this, this kind of centralized authority and everybody every senior is being asked to sign into that central authority and then they'll literally contact you like when your name comes up and they're going to put everybody on a list and kind of manage it that way yeah when i was talking to folks in north bro there's nothing like that you know it, it sounds so it sounds like it's very like town by town right in terms of do you know if if on the vineyard is there one kind of standard strategy and will there be one point of vaccinations or are they going to be like all over the place and this is really to either of you. I'm just, I'm just curious. I, I haven't heard any news on the planning for that. I mean, I, I'm sure the hospital would have a pretty big role in that. Um, but obviously, haven't heard any anything set in stone of of if there's going to be like a major site, like just like we do the testing up at the high school. If there's going to be something like that, um, it's hard to tell. Um, but the boards of health also play a big role, of course, and and planning and, and getting the news out there to people of, of who who's gonna be in the different phases and that kind of thing. And so uh, it's like I said, it's just another another waiting game for us, unfortunately. <laughs> it is, and I think that's fine. I mean, it is, I know it's really difficult and it's not fine for some people, but the reality is, is this has always been a, a managed by crisis situation. And the fact that we've got some vaccine and it's starting to get distributed and um, I think it's, we've only, you know, it's only going to go up from here. So I think things will get better. Megan, I think that, you know, I was talking to several colleagues today and we were saying that some of the surprises of our elder, you know, there's been some positives um, within our community and within the elder population um, through the COVID. There's been some really cool things that have come from the COVID. And, um, and I just wanted to see if, during the second part of our show today, if we could sort of talk about some of the sort of surprising, happy things or positive things that have come of this. Um, you talked about the meal distribution um, a little while ago, and, and I wanna hear more about that for our elders. And then also one of the things that I've seen is for our elders that were having trouble getting out, either they couldn't or their caregiver that always did errands for them was unavailable or they were just afraid is almost all the pharmacies now, um, most of them, not all, are, are delivering to people that, um, that need to get a hold of medications and can't. So can you speak to a little bit of that stuff? Absolutely. I, I think that the response in our community has been outstanding in, in a lot of different areas. Um, and we speak of food. Um, a lot of people have had to adapt their programs and Meals on Wheels is one of them. I mean, before we would go into the home and we'd have, you know, a five minute conversation with people and, and kind of do that whole thing. And we had to change to the contactless delivery. So, you know, now people are, are getting their meals, but they're kind of waving or saying hello through inside the home and, and just to keep our volunteers and our, um, you know, our elders safe. 
Um, but but the volunteering and the the need and the sense to help out in the community has just been so huge since COVID and it's been so inspiring to see all these people coming out and wanting to help deliver Meals on Wheels or um, just an example, the food pantry has a delivery service now for, for groceries. And wow. so that's been outstanding. And wow. so just, just to see all these programs adapting so well, um, I mean, unfortunately it is hard times, but everyone has done such a, a good job as far as I've seen the community of adapting to this and, and trying to best suit the needs of, of everyone through through this pandemic so that's been really really good and inspiring to see it has been i've been so inspired to see how some the other part about it too is is the zooming you know we've got elders zooming all over the place you know and and they're zooming with their family members and they're figuring it out on their ipads and and um and the doctors are are being able to to really spend quality time through the zoom um, yep. We at Horizons are running around doing a lot of connecting elders to their doctors through a Zoom, and there's such relaxed visits, and there's really not much that's missing because as nurses, we can do the vitals, so at least the doctors get the vital signs, which they might not otherwise, but, but many of the doctors have said to me, it's so cool to see my patients with their favorite cat on their lap, or just get a little bit of a view of their environment that I wouldn't have seen otherwise. And yeah. Um, so some really cool things have come of this. And, and I think people are connecting with their doctors yep. and the specialists. We've, we've had, you know, a big run on neurology appointments. Neurology is really hard on Martha's Vineyard, but, um, but because they're Zooming, we're connecting people with their neurologists more um, because they don't have, they, they can't, but they don't have to go all the way to Boston to see their neurologist. They can see them from their dining room table. So there's been some i just want us to have them it's this sucks there's no doubt about it this has been terrible um and we've had a lot of friends and family members that have gotten sick but but on the plus side there's also been a sense of coming together as a community that i don't think we would have seen otherwise and yeah. i hope a lot of it goes on and on yeah and like you said, Sandy, the communication, I think, has definitely, even though it's not face to face for a lot of people, I think people are going the extra mile to reach out to someone that they wouldn't have before and check in with them. And so I think that that's been a really, and like you said, Zoom has been really all over the place and people are learning that and um, the I, you guys are aware of the Martha's Vineyard Center for Living that that unfortunately has had to stop operating their in person um, supportive day program, which we offer through our home care program to, to people who are um, who are interested through home care through us. Um, they have a Zoom. They have a Zoom program that's working wonders and people are loving it. And even though they're not in person anymore, they're still able to do that with their family. And so that's that's a really positive outcome, at least um, for people like another example of people adapting and still trying to communicate, even though it's it's not in person. I think that with that program, what's been really cool too, I'm sorry, Arthur, I keep blocking you out. I think the other thing that's really cool about that program is the family members and loved ones of the elders that used to just get dropped off at the program, now that it's Zooming at their dining room table or in their living room or wherever at the house, the other family members are seeing what's going on in there and participating. You know, we, I, I was on one, one day recently that was one of the music ones and looking at all the folks that were Zooming in and their family members that were all sitting around them singing with us. And um, that couldn't happen if, if their elder was dropped off at the program and they weren't there with them. So right. I'm gonna keep my rose colored glasses on and which <laughs> makes some people a little nuts, but I'm gonna keep my rose colored glasses on. So some things that have come up that are positives that I'm gonna really be pushing to continue even when we get back to whatever our new normal is. I suppose that's the that's actually the question was the question I was going to ask Megan was whether from from looking at the things that elder services does because there's such a huge variety of things are there any particular things that you that have come up as a result of COVID that you could imagine keeping or 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 ways of service delivery that have come up that you think will probably stay even in a world in which at least in theory, people can go out, you know, can now get out of the house and do all of this other stuff. I just, I just didn't know because it does, see, there are some things that people have gotten used to now that they never would have done. And, 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 when, and Sandy, when you describe that, 
you know, really the memory cafe day at, at, at the Center for Living, you know, in many ways, you know, the whole point of the memory cafe, um, in, in the, there have been a lot of memory cafes developed statewide over the last 10 years, but the, the specialness of them has always been that the caregivers are there, you know, that they are not just dropping people off, that they're there. And so the caregivers are interacting and stuff, you know, but this to have this new form where the caregivers are, are all kind of connected and used to connecting through Zoom, it, it seems like it's been a wonderful thing, you know. But but Megan, to you, you know, back to my my question: Do you do you can you imagine any of this stuff continuing, or any of any of these changes continuing? I think for us, we would like to go back to a more in-person model, just because that's how we've done things, and I think it's worked out great how we do. Um, you know, for instance, through home care, we we've done a hybrid telephonic model. Um, for our home visits, whereas previously our home visits for that program used to be done all in person. Now it's, um, you know, in person, as long as we can adhere to the CDC guidelines of safety for the elders and for our um, care managers. Um, and so that's, that's been a good adaptation. It's just something that I think in the future when we can go back to a more in person thing, um, we, we would do, but I think the ability to be able to, to do that and to move to Zoom and to move to telephonic and to be able to have those outlets of communication and to learn them and to know them, I think is a huge <laughs> plus, um, just in case something like this would happen and, and you know we'd be more prepared for how we need to communicate and still outreach to other people. So I think that that's been a really good learning situation for everyone. And Sandy, what about as far as your stuff is concerned? Can, can you, do you imagine that, you know, that, that, that working with, as, as a geriatric care manager, or working with a whole bunch of different people, do you imagine aspects of this, like you were talking about the, the increased convenience of these kind of Zoom-based doctor's visits, for example, you know, can you imagine some of those kind of being incorporated into, into your, your, the future life, you know, beyond, because it's getting so close now. I mean, you know, we all, we're all, you know, it's not really, really close, but you really want it to be really close finally, you know? It's well, like, at least there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Um, yeah like I gets, think uh, I want to, I want to try to keep some of the positive aspects of, you know, I, I don't know the, obviously the main payer sources like the insurance companies, Medicare for these doctor visits. Um, they, we did this because we're in the middle of an emergency and a pandemic. I'm really hoping that we can convince them as a society that there is a benefit for some folks that really need to see their doctor but can't get there, especially in a, a tiny little community like ours that's out in the middle of the ocean. So I am hoping to, I agree with Megan, there's nothing that beats a face-to-face -face, um, when you can do it, but I'm hoping that we, what we get, our new normal is some sort of mixture of, of all of it. Right, and I guess that's it, because I was thinking, Megan, when you were talking about the Meals on Wheels and the success of what you're doing, and, and it, it has been terrific, but, but what you don't get, as you, as you said it kind of in your beginning, is that is that 10-minute conversation, you know, so that folks who are, you know, so the, so the folks you're seeing can see you, and, and so that your person can just kind of check in, mm -hmm. right? you know, how is, how, so how are things really going? You know, as opposed yeah. to you just kind of you're waving, you know, and so yeah. that's a that's a. It's been hard to not have that, you know, and I think we've all a lot of seniors have kind of paid, you know, for that not, not being able to do that, you know. Well, there is right. no doubt. There is no doubt at all that our seniors that are not interacting with people as much as they used to. We are definitely seeing a pretty broad spread decline in cognition, and some of our seniors that really struggled and needed that human contact, needed that 10 minute conversation. And we definitely are seeing some of our dementia patients that are have, have aged faster through this than they would have. And I think it's because of that contact or lack thereof. Right, that part's really hard. That part's really hard. Mm -hmm. So, so Megan, my, one of my, my jobs here are, are one to provide comic relief, but also to watch the time. And I'm watching our clock and realizing that our, that our, that our show is about them, but I just, you know, Sandy, I just really wanted to, you know, thank you for finding Megan and convincing her to do this again, right? I'm glad that I was the reason why the two of you got to hook up again. You know, I know it's been ages. Me too. Thanks, Arthur. 
Good to see everyone's face, even if it's on Zoom. <laughs> and Megan, before we end though, can you just, if an elder that's watching or a family member that's watching really wants to know, who's my, who's my quarterback here? Who can I call that can give me an answer, even if it's to say, I don't have an answer yet? Who do you think we would direct them to? Absolutely. If it's anything to do with our programs and services or even outside resources, I'm always available as a contact. Um, feel free to call for any any questions about elder services. Um, that, I also suggest that, the Council on Aging clear? just because they're so broad and they, yeah. you know, they do have the resources and they're connected to all the organizations and, and that's their role um, is to, you know, be that that main contact and resource. But of course, I'm always available as well for, for questions regarding our services and programs. What's that number, Megan? That's oh, for our, our main yeah. office number is 508-693-4393. That's great. I know you'd be so excited. <laughs> so Sorry, thank Megan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Megan, for do, being willing to do this. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. And folks, thanks for watching. Uh, happy beginning of 2021. We're all going to get through this. You got to stay safe, right? It's, we're almost at the end here. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next installment of Frank and Mary here on Martha's Vineyard. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>